<laughs> Welcome to the GMI Hub online, and tonight we are going to be having a fantastic time as we go and talk about songwriting. Now, yeah. songwriting is something that we do every month, and we just want to we want welcome you to watch. And uh, today on the show, we've got Kalita and Carolyn, and we're going to introduce them a little bit later. But right now, so you know, I am Dale Borland. Yeah. Songwriting is something that we do every month. Wow, I'm getting a bit of an echo here. Welcome, everybody. So glad to see you here. And we are so excited to have, well, we want to welcome these two award-winning uh, singer-songwriters. We have two amazing guests today with Carolyn Ahrens and we have uh, Kalita Haverland. And uh, these are both Canadian musicians, amazing, phenomenal artists um, from uh, from many uh, many of us who have been in Christian Christian music for for some time will know these artists very familiar with these artists and i've had the pleasure of um just being being in love with her but she's amazing i've known her for such a long time and i just want tonight is going to be able to present some of her amazing uh, techniques of songwriting and we're going to talk a bit about that also okay. carolyn aarons is here uh, carolyn has been in the christian music scene for over a couple of decades and i tell you she has got an amazing story and uh, as well as kalita they both have amazing stories and tonight we're going to be able to help unpack songwriting. So first of all, let's start off with talking a bit about your journey. So let's start off with maybe Kalita. You could talk about your journey, how you got started, uh, what's what's your inspiration to get to where you are today? Sure, that's a loaded question. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I, um, I grew up in Southern Alberta. And so my father had the country radio station soldered in the pickup truck to the country station. And uh, I really didn't like country music, but I couldn't help it because when you live in rural Alberta, that just happens to be an influence. Like shows like uh, CBC's Tommy Hunter and John Messer. And, um, but I, I gravitated to the piano and that is my instrument. That's been the instrument that I've played for years and that I start, uh, first started writing on. And I first started writing when I was 11 years old. Um, I was singing before that, you know, to the farm animals and any, anyone who would give me an audience. Um, but that's this more serious part of my um, my writing started just shortly after my dad uh, passed away. And um, it's a it's a moment I'll always remember. I was grieving him and sitting at my piano. I'd been playing piano for about two years, taking lessons and. And I just had this, uh, this thing come over me of grief and trying to understand um, my, my father uh, and why he took his life. So it was a very tragic passing. And it was in that moment that I began to share my feelings um, between the keyboard and my voice. Um, and that's when my first song was born. And um, that day was very very special because it, I, I remember feeling like there was someone else in the room and there wasn't anyone, but I think that that was the, the spirit of God, the Holy spirit that was imparting something to me. So in a nutshell, my music, my songwriting has been a lifeline for me throughout my whole uh, life. And, and as I grew and mature and became a musician and an artist, then that's when I started developing and learning how to work my craft. And you, when, when would you say you kind of first spread your wings as, a, as, a, as an artist? Like when you first started saying, what year would that have been? Uh, do you mean professionally? The first $50 I ever made was singing <laughs> Chris Christofferson's Help Me Make It Through the Night at a local pub just outside of York University. Wow. And I, I, I went to university for four years at York University and moved from Calgary to Toronto and attended university. And but I was in theater and uh, I always had a love for theater. I had been acting and creating my characters over the years. But when it came down to uh, secondary education, I, I chose theater and then I immediately became a musician once I, you know, graduated and finished theater. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever but, do musical theater? Did you ever do musical theater when you were? Oh there? yes, I did musical yeah. theater. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you recall that very first gig? Oh, that? oh yes, I do because I it was uh, summer stock at um, Port Dover Theater. It was the very first year that the theater opened, 
Um, the theater is happens to be in City Hall, which wow. was old City Hall. It was the town hall. And, um, and I was part of the, the group of students of many who had graduated from theater school who went and we had um, a grant by the government, well, the theater did, the town did. And we uh, actually worked the theater, like we painted, we cleaned toilets, we did everything until it was time for um, the season to open. And so my first, my first professional job was in musical theater and I played uh, Gypsy in Gypsy Rosalie. Very cool. All mm -hmm. right, Carolyn, let's take a little journey back in time to whenever you first kind of got established your songwriting techniques or whatever, what inspired you to get to do what you're doing today? Well, uh, some similarities to Kalita and some differences. Kalita, your man, your first song that is so moving it speaks so much to what a gift uh, being able to write songs is. Um, I think I was ten or eleven when I wrote my first song too, so we're similar that way. Uh, started on piano, but then one day my dad brought home this little orange gut string guitar, <clears throat> and we learned how to play "Hang Down Your Head" Tom Dooley on it, and. Um, and then I wrote, around 10, I wrote a song for my mom for Mother's Day. It was a huge hit in the Jonet household. That was my maiden name. <laughs> Just straight to number one with a bullet. Uh, the Mother's Day song for my mom. And I was a really, really shy kid. I think this is where I might be different from Kalita. I think Kalita's a lot more extroverted than I am. But I was very shy, and I found uh, songwriting was a way to it was how I found my voice. And um, kind of my apprenticeship, I was really really fortunate and I went to this little Baptist church in Coquitlam BC and from about 12 on the pastor would call me and he'd say I'm preaching on this next week write me a song uh, to go with my message and then I would inflict these new you know 12 year old songs on this poor little Baptist congregation who kind of loved loved my writing into being so that's how I got started and uh, when I went to university it wasn't in music I thought you know a music career was sort of a preposterous thing that would happen to extraordinary people and mm -hmm. certainly not to someone like me. Um, so I started in pre-med, very quickly got out of pre-med and into the liberal arts. Pre-med classes, they all started at eight, nine in the morning. And I wasn't owning the fact that I was a musician yet, but I definitely had a musician's circadian rhythm. I did not want to be at 8 a.m. biology. So switched over to liberal arts, got a psych degree, uh, was dating a guy named Mark Ahrens, and uh, it was right before the, my senior year of university. He sat me down and he said, Carolyn, it's kind of obvious to everyone except you that you should be doing music. It's your mm. passion. It's when you come alive. And uh, that same summer, I, I went to a music conference, got my met the person who became um, my first publisher, and uh, that's how my my career started to to happen more professionally. Would you say your first performance was a church thing? Was it? Or would, or would had to be, had to be. Yeah. Although Kalina <laughs> and I have a, a Chris Christopherson connection because as oh. soon as she said that, I remember singing Why Me Lord at some little music competition. <laughs> I don't know if I got 50 bucks, but I think I got a little trophy. So there was some, there was some uh, uh, affirmation there that I was on the right track. Very cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. Kalita, you came up with a concept, uh, your story, your song. Yeah. Can you tell us Well, it's not, you know, it's not really my concept. Oh. I mean, other people do it, but it's, um, yeah, it's where I take other people's stories and turn their, their stories into songs, and then I record them. So over the years, as being an artist and a musician and songwriter, I've had the opportunity of being able to write some commissioned songs for certain organizations. And I always enjoyed that, you know. Um, most of my writing comes from per personal experiences. And, um, and I, when I was in country music, I did a lot more co-writing with other people, you know, like the Nashville thing. You, you get together with another person and you have an appointment and you say, okay, today we're writing a song or maybe we'll write two songs. And so I've tasted that too. But what I like is having the, um, the assignment and, it, and it's kind of a challenge and to take somebody else's story and totally immerse myself in the lives of these people and then come up with something creative. So how did I start it? That was a long answer. Um, actually, it was through uh, my... Um, Pledge Music uh, 
fund me program that I did a couple of years ago. And I'd seen that other artists were doing it. You know, I know Carol has done it too. Um, when she's uh, raised money for some of her CDs. Um, and that was one of the rewards is if you, you know, want a song written by yours truly, then it would cost you this much. So I did that for someone. They actually ordered the song and I enjoyed it so much that I thought, well, why don't I do, do it again? And so that's when I put together the idea of calling it your story, your song. And, um, and now I've done, I've done several over the last couple of years and uh, I love it. It's fun. It's creative. And, and it gets me writing. Right. So let, let's unpack a little bit later. We're going to unpack your technique and how you would de develop a song. Um, uh, but before we do that, uh, uh, Carolyn recently um, had a release from a song that was written back in 97. Is that right, Carolyn? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so what, what is that like for you now thinking this song hasn't been released until now? <laughs> So it's very start. strange. Yeah, the story behind that, it's a it's a song that uh, the very first tour I ever did was opening for Rich Mullins. Uh, that oh, wow. Some people may know Rich uh, wrote Our God is an Awesome God and lots of really great songs. Hold Me Jesus is a favorite. Um, and so I, my first tour was opening for Rich and another artist named Ashley Cleveland. And, and um, 18 months after that tour, as many people know, Rich was tragically killed in a car wreck. And for me, uh, that was the first time losing somebody really out of season, really uh, young. And uh, so at that time, just kind of reflexively, I uh, wrote this song called At a Loss. And then I think we had considered putting it on my, around, that was around the time I was recording my third album. But for whatever reason, we never did. And I kind of forgot about the song. Um, but over the last several months, I've been writing once a week to, uh, um, I kind of revived a, a mailing list. People who, who are listening, it's great to have a mailing list. It's great to have, um, you know, a community of people and kind of keep in regular touch with them. And uh, so I've been writing this mailing list and I've been trying to give them some something new every week. I always send out an email every Sunday. And one of the people on the mailing list had heard this at a loss song and she said, hey, you should, you should share this with the mailing list. And so I found the demo it, it the demo even sounded different than I remembered like I don't actually remember singing the demo at first I was like is this me and then I listened some more and no it's me um so anyway I share I made a lyric video for for the people on this mailing list there's about 3,000 people on this mailing list and um and they just connected so strongly and they weren't sending me emails like great song they were sending me emails like this was the greatest loss in my life uh, this, this helps me access this part of my story. And it was so moving to see that, that we thought, Hey, you know, in this age of streaming, we can just release this as a single. So we did, we released it publicly and my, my kids listen to it and they're like, you used to have a younger voice, <laughs> That's, but it's been, yeah, it's been kind of neat to have that time capsule, uh, come out and watch it we connect with people. song written that long ago, connect to, connects with people on a level. That's really amazing. Okay, um, yeah. I want to talk about more about songwriting, how you would develop a song. Uh, let's say Kalita, someone gives you a story or whatever, and what do you do with that to build it into a song? What, do you music first, lyrics, for, or what? Yeah, uh, I, I've been doing lyrics first for a long time now. When I was younger, um, I used to do, you know, both hand in hand sometimes at the same time, but I definitely have uh definitely start with the lyrics first and especially when i'm doing a song like for your story your song you know what i do then is i collect i, I send out a questionnaire to the person that's um hiring me and if i'm writing a song let's say for their 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 mother who might be celebrating her 80th birthday then i get I get the siblings to send me all of their memories and any stories that they think that are important to them and just their feelings and their thoughts. And they put them on, you know, paper, no, not real paper, but and they send them off to me. And I just start looking through all of them and I see the, the similar threads of, oh, this person mentions this little memory. And I get a sense of who this person is and what's important um, to the people who are writing. 
And then it's interesting because this is where I feel that God comes in. I try to think of that person that I'm writing for. And I think, what is it that is going to really honor them? And what is it that is really going to make them feel like one in a million and that they're really being respected and loved and cared for? And I try to get a sense and an essence of who the person is. Some songs are more literal, you know, like it tells the story of where they grew up and, and sort of what, where their life has gone. And then other stories, uh, songs might just be a, a feeling or like I said, the essence of who that person is and it might not be as literal. And once I start working with the lyrics, then I sit down at the piano and we'll often have a shell and then and then that's really where the magic happens. You know, I, I am a, a trained musician. I have my grade eight piano, but ever since I started writing, my songwriting and how I play the piano are two different things. Even when I started writing as a young girl, I never incorporated any of the things that I was learning from my piano lessons. It was purely a gift. I play by ear. You can ask my husband, Gord, who's produced so many of my albums. I don't even know what chords I'm playing. <laughs> Carolyn, I'm sorry, it's the truth. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting, but that gift that God gave me, ha you know, it, it works in mysterious ways. So, I sometimes will come and I'll sit down at the piano and I'll just start messing around, just playing around, putting my hands on the keyboard and finding something. And then I'll start the melody. And I'm telling you, it's, it's almost like an out of body experience at times. And it's, I'm not saying that it's always like that, but when a song is really inspired and Carolyn might attest to this too, that's when things happen. Do you have like a, um, as well, I mean, that, that is very true, but is there, sometimes you sit and okay, okay, my theme is going to be on this and I'm right down my theme and I bring on my relative terms and all my rhyming scheme. You got those things. Do, is there a method that you would work through? Um, well, you know, yeah, I mean, rhyming and, you know, whatever you choose to do, whether it's free form or, or rhyming. Yeah. I mean, that just comes to me. I mean, I have learned you know over the years um and being a singer uh as well and singing your own songs you know the feeling of the music and how it transcends uh with the words how the words sound when you're singing them the flow how a word can be too choppy or how a word can be um, too many syllables. Right. When, yeah. when, when you sing and play and do that over and over as many years as I've been doing, you know what you like, you know what sounds good or what stands out. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your no, question. No, you're, you're, think, you're thinking about the syncopations and the timings of the beat, the rhythm. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. I, I have a friend of mine who writes, like for instance, a song is about um, her car. So she write down the word car. And you say, what things about things about cars, but speed, oh, I, yeah, yeah, right, you know, yeah. safety, all, all these different things. She yeah. good looking, all these kinds of things, engine. Yeah. All these type, and then she uses as a reference point to build the verses. Yeah. yeah. I have done that in the past for sure. Yeah. you got a theme and you write down all your thoughts and yeah, before you actually start formulating lyrics to get your different bubbles of, of, uh, of, of words that are going to, you know, describe or yeah, they help to build your concepts. Uh, Carolyn, yeah. is, that, is that, it sounds like you're nodding like that's something that you're, you're doing or you do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I, I like hearing Kalita say, uh, she starts with lyrics for me. You, you, lyrics are usually the point of the spear. And, uh, like Kalita, I had a stage of my career where I was co-writing with Nashville writers a lot. And a lot of them write very successfully starting with music first. For me, that's all I hate having a piece of music where I don't know what it's about. I feel like it stalks me. I, you know, what am I about? It goes right. So I love to start, uh, and I think this is maybe part of what you're asking. I, I love to start with a thematic thing that I want to write about. And then I'm hoping and praying that that crystallizes into some kind of hook, some kind of phrase. It's probably going to be the title that somehow encapsulates that theme in a creative or whimsical or striking uh, way. And then I'm going to use that as kind of my North Star. And I'm going to try to make sure 
uh, everything lyrically in the song somehow is feeding uh, that hook. Because when I when I first started writing, I would send off my songs to my publisher when I had my first publishing deal, and she would say, "This is great, Carolyn, but it's seven songs. Pick <laughs> pick the one thing that this song is going to be about, and then write me six other songs about the other six ideas." Uh, but you know, for for a while, I taught a college course on songwriting, and one of the things I learned is that you can't teach inspiration. I think inspiration is really mysterious. It's going to happen for Kalita a particular way, for each of us a particular way. And inspiration is more about um, how you're nourishing yourself, what you're exposing yourself to, exposing yourself to great music, to great writing, to great art, to great conversations, kind of whatever ingredients you're putting into your life are pretty much all you've got to work with in terms of what's going to come out. Um, so inspiration is about living a certain way. Uh, it's, it's very close to discipleship, I think, you know, being receptive as an artist and being a disciple. Um, so you can't teach that, but once you have a rough draft of something, then I think there are some questions you can ask of a song. So when, when I was teaching songwriting, I just said, I can't, I can't teach you to have that impulse, that that desire where something starts bubbling up in the middle of the night or when you're supposed to be working on your other homework that has nothing to do with music or whatever. Um, you can't teach that part. But once you have something, once you have a draft of something, then I think there are a bunch of um, craft and uh, technique questions that you can ask. So one of them is like, what is my hook? Is it a strong enough hook to kind of sustain this song out in the world and is everything in the song feeding the hook and and then another one is the one Kalita was getting at is how is the prosody how is the marriage between the words and the music and for Kalita it's happening totally organically she doesn't even have to ask that question because she's been doing it for so long but she like like Kalita I just sing it over and over and over again and the and the more I sing it the more that the clunky extra words drop away and and the where where I was having to sing the emphasis on the wrong syllable, I realize it and I, I start to fix it, you know. So I think there are there are a series of questions you can ask once you have um, a rough a rough draft of something. But that first inspiration, you just gotta you, one thing that will, I'll just say one more thing about that. One thing that I've already heard in our conversation together that will help that inspiration is a deadline. It really is like a if you will if you build it it will come kind of thing. So I uh, in years where I wasn't writing much at all, I had a commitment with my local church to always write a new Christmas song every Christmas Eve, which seemed like a good idea like twenty Christmas songs ago, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> now it's a, but it, it's actually a really cool discipline to every year to try to re-enter the story in a fresh way. But what I noticed was in years where I wasn't writing anything else, I was still writing that Christmas song. Why? Because I said I would, because I had a commitment. So anything you can do, I know you guys just recently had a had an assignment for people to write Christmas songs. I think that's brilliant because sometimes, at least the way I'm wired, I don't know about you, Kalita, but the way I'm wired... I need a deadline, I need an assignment, and then that will just kind of force the muse to come out of hiding if everything goes well. So I'm curious now, how soon do you start a Christmas song? Oh, yeah, it's different, different years. Like, okay. for example, I haven't even thought about it uh, this year. Um, so yeah, sometimes I always sing it on Christmas Eve. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, I get it nice and early in the year, and other times it's December 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wow. praying for the ghost of Christmas song future to come and help me out. Yeah. I was just going to say, while you were talking, Carolyn, uh, there was something that I, I thought, and I'm sure you do it and a lot of writers do it. And it might be helpful for the listeners today is that um, to help find that inspiration or to recall it or to remember it, it's great to, to journal. And I think journaling is probably more popular than it's ever been. All you have to do is go to Indigo and see all the beautiful journals that you can choose from. So it makes you want to write. But that's been handy over the years is to have a journal and, um, and or to keep it by your bedside or in your car or in your purse or wherever. And when something comes to you or when you observe something or you hear something in a conversation is to have that ability whether it's in the notes on your phone, is to write it down because inevitably we forget about it. 
So that's a, that's a good practice uh, for songwriter, for anyone who's creative actually, is to have that, that memory, that note that you can refer to later. And a lot of times that will inspire you, inspire you find something that you wrote two years ago and you go, oh, yeah. And then it can, you know, percolate once you see it again. Oh, I was going to say musical ideas too. You know, in the old days, yeah. you used to have to call home and sing onto your answering machine when you, when you had a, new, a melody that was, seemed like it would be a winner. Uh, but now you can just sing it right into your phone. And that's, that's a great idea too. Uh, capture those things when they come. I just wanted to remind people who they're watching right now. Hi. Um, in our panel tonight, we have Kalita and Carolyn. Kalita is a five-time Juno nominee, a multi-award winning recording artist, songwriter, comedian, and an inspirational speaker. She writes and she sings, she speaks, and she gleans from her own life experiences and she's performing for many years. And also Carolyn Ahrens has 12 albums behind her. She has three uh, critically acclaimed books. Um, she's a songwriter, top 10 radio singles, Canadian pop, US Canadian chart, Christian charts in the US. Um, so two Dove uh, Awards and three Juno nominees, uh, and it goes on. She's amazing. We're so glad to have these ladies here today. We have um, a great platform for you at home to listen as we find out how to develop your writing skills in song. And also, um, I'm Dale, and we have Cheryl Duick here, who is um, heading up this whole thing. <laughs> Um, as I was listening to you ladies, um, it's interesting you're talking about inspiration and how to get inspiration for the lyrics. I'm curious about the arrangement of the songs as well. Do you find that as you are writing, whether you're writing for someone else or writing for a particular theme or goal, that the, 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 the arrangement or the song style ends up changing because of what you're writing and because of where the inspiration is going. You want to go first, Kalita? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, it can. Yeah. Especially uh, the first part of my career, I was a staff writer for a company in Nashville writing for other people. So then very much um, uh, often I'd be given maybe a track to write to. And um, so I could be quite outside of my normal uh, zone, um, writing melodies and lyrics to pre-existing tracks. These days I mostly write, uh, for myself, but, uh, definitely again, my preferred thing is sort of to go with something as it's coming, not, not contrive it too much. I, I, uh, I subscribe to a, a model of the creative process. Uh, can I go on a tangent for one minute? I, I promise it will help. I, I think anyway, um, it has four, st uh, a model of the creative process that has four stages. The first stage is preparation, which is kind of your whole life, plus any little things you do to sit down and write. Like if you got to have, I have to have these yellow staple pencils and some M&Ms help and, you know, light a candle and a certain piano and not too much other noise or guitar or whatever. Um, the second stage is incubation, which is when an idea is percolating. And that can be in a, in a short songwriting session, or it could take two years, or I've had a song that's incubated for 10 years. I knew there was something there, but it had to keep incubating. So that's when like everything you're hearing or playing sort of, oh, that would work for that. And that connects with this, you know, every, everybody probably recognizes that stage. And then um, illumination is the aha moment when it's actually coming. And I'm a big believer that in the illumination stage, you have to tell your critic to get out of the room, your editor to get out of the room, even your, um, oh, I wanted this to really slam as a country hit or a gospel hit or all those kinds of things have to kind of get out of the room and you just have to serve the work and kind of see what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when that is totally spent, that aha illumination part, then you have this verification phase. And that's kind of what I was referring to earlier where you can ask a series of questions of this work. Is this work everything that it can be? So in that illumination phase, no idea is a bad idea. You're writing the greatest song that's ever been written. Um, you have to silence, you know, your editor and your critic. Then uh, 
uh, when you switch over to verification, then everything's fair game. You take the scalpel out, you see what's working, what's not. And that would be, Cheryl, where I would go, I would maybe look at what chords I'm playing and what groove is happening. Sometimes I've moved a song from 6-8 to 4-4 four, four in verification, or I've realized it should be in a minor key, not a major key in verification. Or if I reworked this, it would work a lot better for this genre. Or would, you know, if I'm trying to write a worship song, which I'm not very good at for corporate expression, you know, I'm going to have to simplify or, or whatever. Um, that, ha that for me, that works much better in, in verification. And then sometimes in verification, something will all of a sudden click and you'll go, oh, we can go this direction. And it might throw you back into illumination. And then you need to recognize that that's happening. Tell your critic that you'll confer with her later and uh, just serve the work again and, and see what goes. Does that make sense? The, do you recognize those stages? Yeah, it, it's been yeah. really helpful for me because when I... When I, again, when I got my first publishing deal, all of a sudden I could hear what my publisher was going to say about these songs while I was writing them and it shut down illumination. So I had to say, to, I had to learn, I didn't have this terminology for it then, but I had to learn to say to myself, you can be critical tomorrow. Today, you're just going to receive um, what's coming for as long as it will come. So, yeah. I think that is so so true because I think a lot of us that are writing like uh, maybe I can't speak for everybody else I know for myself I think I don't allow the illumination I get right to the verification right and right. it's like oh that's a silly idea I'm gonna scratch 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 and you know rip the papers and all that but a lot of the you know a lot of the the good music is probably coming through all the well, I guess corporate world, they call it brainstorming, but that's illumination, right? Just, it's like, yeah. no idea is a bad idea. Just throw it out there, try all the different tunes, try all the different lyrics, and then take it, the pieces together and see what comes up and then <laughs> criticize it afterwards. But, but it is interesting that you mentioned that. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I think a lot of us, I think skip some of those stages, you know, I don't know. Did, Dale, do you feel that way? Yeah, I think, I think the, the challenge is whenever you haven't got the experience, you're always trying to figure you're, you're treading in water. You're not familiar with. So um, taking that time to, to have the steps that you can go through that what Carolyn was talking about is, is helpful to people who are maybe sitting down and, and saying, is my stuff okay? Am I, am I can I do this? You know, uh, I just play for myself, you know, but when you're going through that kind of that stages and, and you're able to um, maybe process it better, maybe the final outcome will be something greater than, than that you originally had planned. And, and that's why um, for, for me, songwriting can be um, very personal, but it can also be very uh, public. Like that, that's the, 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 there's always this thing about being, um, when you're writing a song, you say, well, anybody else understand this? Because it's from here. I don't know if they'll get it. And and you might be surprised how some people can really resonate, uh, like what Carolyn's song that she talked about that she just released from, from many years ago. It's just, you just never know. Um, but if you're going through the processes and having a sounding board, I think is really important. But I never heard someone say it quite like that before about you know get everybody else out of the room I, I just need to be in that state where i'm being creative and let me be finished and when i finish the creative stuff then we can analyze it but right now you know i, I never heard that yeah. that way before it's it's important i want to i want to hear how it maps onto kalita's experience but i'll just say like the uh there's like a list of illumination killers and one of them is is surveillance and meaning having anyone in the room who isn't invested in the pro in the process right. so you can have like a collaborator in the room but you just can't have like a watcher <laughs> in the room for some reason you know the muse is kind of shy I, I, and and so everybody in the room has to be invested in it and uh, an another one is being like too outcome oriented uh, um feeling like you know uh, uh i remember you know getting pitch sheets uh when I was writing for publishers, you know, we need a top 10 hit for this artist that has to sound like this last song. And for me, I just, it was an illumination killer because it was too outcome oriented. Um, but of course, the other mistake 
that some people make is they never go to verification. They, they enjoy illumination so much um, that they think, well, this is how God gave me the song and it's, ah, you know, and they never, uh, uh, verification is kind of what separates the a amateurs from the pros, but going to verification too soon will just shut down uh, the whole, sorry, the whole process. Um, and so, yeah, so it's been really helpful for, for me to distinguish between those two phases, recognize that they're both really, um, important, but be able to kind of self-diagnose which stage I'm in and be faithful to that stage. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite quotes, um, uh, which comes from the non-musical writing world, just the prose writing world is in a first draft, you're just shoving in sand to make sand castles later. Right. And I like that. I like that picture. But how does it map on for you? Kalina, does it ring true or is your process a little different? I love the way you articulated that. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that quite like you did. I love that. The yeah. illumination. It's so true. And I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of artists, you know, need to be true to that illumination. That That's where the creativity, the, the, um, the muse, that's where the thing that makes us artists. And I think when it's shut down too soon, I'm, I mean, I can say that I collaborate with my husband. Oh my gosh, let me tell you stories because he comes from the jazz world and funk and he's a bass player. And then we get together and I'm this singer songwriter who likes Carol King and the Carpenters, you know, and he just wants to make everything funky. So in the beginning, you know, he, and I, he was in the room with me, he would admit he, you know, some of my um, illumination was a bit squashed because he's more <laughs> of an arranger and, and he hears things, you know, I feel things and he hears, hears things. And I suppose that's what makes us a good combo. But in the earlier years when I was just feeling so much and he just wants to get on with it, you know, um, since since then he's he's our collaboration has changed a lot he's mellowed <laughs> and um and he's just understands and and he's been in the room with me when i've been illuminating and this happens during the illumination experience for me when i know that it's god and it's the holy spirit i will i will start to weep and i can't help it and it just happens and then i know i know that this this we can work around it but this little nugget that's just taken place and how god has just spoken through this vessel that is staying and to and to be true to that and to trust that and i think that's something as um a songwriter as an artist especially as a new writer is to find that and know that and not to let anyone take it away from you um i think that's that's so important. And, and, and as you're talking, Carolyn, I was thinking, yeah, so many artists, you know, I mean, we're all sensitive people or we wouldn't be artists. And so our feelings and our ideas can get squashed in a moment. And then we just don't want to share anymore. And we don't think we're good enough. And, you know, and the list goes on of all the negative talk. So we have to feel comfortable and, what also leads me right now is something is which is very important and was told to me so many times as I was um, growing into an artist is that you have to find your own sound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're starting out, uh, I don't know who your influences were, Carolyn, but I, you know, for me, it was Karen Carpenter and, and Carly Simon and Carol King and Anne Murray, although she wasn't a writer, but and Linda Ronstadt, and you know, all the kind of those seventies artists, and um, and I used to try to sound like them. And I had people who were in the business continually telling me, "You need to put those over there. You can like them and love them and be influenced by them, but you have to find your own sound and your own voice." Mm -hmm. And that, for all of you who are listening who are new, that does not happen overnight that is an evolution that takes time and it and it evolves as you get to know who you are as a person and as your life experiences happen but it's finding that 
that sound, that voice that you feel comfortable with, that resonates with you, that you feel like this, this is me. I've had producers over the years, especially in the would take my song, this lovely singer, songwriter song, and then they put all this production to it and change the tempo. And it'd be like, whoa, this, oh, it sounds good. And then I'd get caught up. Well, yeah, it does sound good. And it's very hooky and it'll be great for radio. And, and sometimes it worked and sometimes, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't the artist in me. And, and it took me a long time to trust that artist in me and to know that this was my voice and that that's when I started to work with, you know, producers and Gord being one of them, that had became so important to me because to keep your true voice once you find it, you know, I mean, it's okay to experiment and have fun and, you know, try different things. But at the end of the day, when you're the artist and you're putting a song out there, um, especially if you're the artist that's performing it, you know, you, you, you really value that that truth and that voice that you've developed. Yeah, it's a journey, right? Because you're you're learning yeah. who you are as an artist and uh, in a maturing process to get to the... And even when you get to a certain place, sometimes there's a divergent or there's a, a fork in the road and you're thinking, well, wait a minute. Yeah, so... Sure. That's, that's a challenge mm -hmm. I think most artists go through from, especially from album to album, because there's a lot of pressure for consistency with style. Yeah. Yeah, challenge. well, it, it got me into trouble over the years, for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was very close to signing a record deal with Capitol Records in Nashville. And then the president was fired. He was let go. So everybody that was in their A&R department was let go too. And so my deal was gone. Oh, and that was a huge heartbreak for me. Huge, huge, because I've been working towards that major record deal in the States. And then I um, showcased again for the different label uh, heads. And they didn't know what to do with me. At the end of the day, they liked what I did, but they didn't know what to do with me because mm -hmm. I was hard to pigeonhole. So, so what, would that, what would that do to you as an artist? Did, did you think, am I have to change gears now? Or what was it like for you at that point? You must have been like, ah, oh, who am I? Well, it was at that point that my life, everything in my life was coming to a crashing halt. So um, I continued and, and then this was during my country days. And then I continued, uh, you know, trying to put my next album out on, on my own or on a smaller label here in Canada. Um, but what happened was uh, Shania Twain came out <laughs> and she was definitely ahead of her time. And, um, you know, it was it was hard. It was hard because it was like, wow, what happened there? You know, like, why couldn't that have been me? Yeah. Um, I mean, she's an amazing artist and, you know, a wonderful writer and, you know, has just done amazingly well. But that's also, you know, as an artist and as a writer, those kinds of things can happen in this business. And, you know, we're not really talking about the business of it, but as a, as an artist, uh, you're the product, you're the writer, you know, you, you have to be able to um, adjust and you have to be able to have very thick and tough skin mm -hmm. for those things to be able to roll off and you be able to pick yourself up and sit yourself back at your piano and say, I'm going to keep on going. And, stay true to myself. I mean, that could be one of the reasons that I never did get signed to a major deal is because I've always, you know, I've kind of always done my own thing. And, um, and there's probably a price to it. But at the end of the day, here I am. What can I say? Are you considered an indie artist now? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been an indie artist for a long time. I had major distribution. I was with RCA and Sony um, here in Canada, but I've never had I've never had anything major released in, in the U.S. Well, both of you are more than just songwriters. So, um, but music has is, is always been there in your life. Would you say, what kind of effect does music have on you outside of your career? Well, uh, for, uh, I can jump in. For, for me, it's, it's a language uh, that I can speak, right? And I'm sure it is for you guys too. So, um, these days, I'm an indie artist too, these days, and um, just getting ready to, to release new music and kind of um, learning what 
that looks like in 2021. I mean, things are changing uh, so quickly. Um, uh, so lots of learning and growing, but uh, I also uh, work full time as the director of education for a ministry called Renovari. And when I took that job five years ago, I actually thought, okay, maybe I'm. I felt called to that job. And I remember be- being in a concert after I had already accepted the job but had a gig, and um, playing in the concert and having this dialogue with the Lord the- through the whole concert of, can I lay this down? Can I? because I love it. Can I can I lay it on the altar? And I thought, yeah, I can. I feel so sure that I'm being pulled to this new thing that I can. And so I did, and then got to the new job, was like, I'm not going to insert a bunch of music into this job. I'm going to be faithful to this job. I oversee something called the Renovari Institute for uh, Christian Spiritual Formation. But there was all these places where music would be helpful. Mm-hmm. And um and, you know, a couple years in, music is, I just realized it's, I, I wish I was one of those people who could speak Italian and French and Spanish. I can't. I can only speak English and music. But it is, um, it is a wonderful gift to be able to speak music in that context. So teaching, I'll be teaching on a, on a subject and I'll think, well, I have a song about this. And I used to, I used to... Um, feel like I was in West Side Story, like it was super corny that I was talking and then I burst into song. Uh, but I tried it a few times and people said, oh man, you know, it's it's just everything we know about learning and the way our brains take in information. It is so great to hear something one way and then hear it in a song and the song can kind of come in the back door behind people's defenses. And um, and so, yeah, so I'm I, almost every musician I know is living some kind of hybrid uh, reality uh, in the in the current music economy, and um, and that can actually be a beautiful thing. Music can be a real gift that that you have the language to speak in in whatever work that you're doing. Mm-hmm. How about for you, Kalina? Uh, yeah, I would. That's so awesome um, that that you said yes to the music because mm-hmm. it's so you. And I've experienced it, Carolyn. Carolyn and I go to the same church, and um, <laughs> and not only is she a great teacher she's a great preacher and mm-hmm. she could have her own pulpit any day um for me i um music has like i said earlier it's been a lifeline for me it's been a huge part of of my healing journey and i would say that my ministry has been every bit as much healing as it is a music ministry so music for me has been an expression of all the experiences that have taken place in my life and continues to be. And um, it's been a tool, it's been a tool and a a resource for many people who have shared with me that my music has really helped them through uh, so many different places, depending on the circumstance. And so music has been a healing tool. And um, I feel so blessed that that I've been able to do something that I'd love to do and have it as a career and, and to be able to continue, um, you know, continue writing. I think, I hope I got a few songs in me left, but I um, think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, you never know. Right. Carolyn. Sometimes I think, I don't know, will this be the last song I'll ever write mm-hmm. right now. I'm focusing on um, right now. I'm focusing on my memoir. And it's interesting, Carolyn, because you said that, you know, you like to you speak and then you sing and feel like you're going into West Side Story. Um, but I've been doing that for years now. And it, it wasn't something I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. It just happened because as I began to um, come out of the country and, and into the Christian music scene, um, I would get asked to share my story. And I had a few songs that went with my story. And so I would share my story, sing a song, share the story, tell the, sing the song. And so basically that's what I've been doing for many, many years now. So now what I'm focusing on is my memoir. And as I'm writing my memoir, uh, when I put the audio book together or when my publisher does, I would love a publisher, um, is I'm going to insert the songs that go with the story. And, and some of them have been written at that time when I've experienced those things. And some of them, like you, Carolyn, um, I've got some songs that I have written that have never been recorded and have wow. never been, been exposed. 
So, so that's where my focus is. And still the music at the end of the day, for me, it all starts with the music. And that's, that's been the basis for my healing and my career and, and my expression of, of who I am. So it sounds like it's been a a therapeutic process in some ways and a learning, learning experiences that, you know, for, for, for me, you study and you, you work on a song and you're, you're doing research and you start to learn as you, as you put songs together sometimes. And they're, they're a sermon in themselves, right? And Caroline, you talk about, you know, public speaking and Kalita, you public speak as well. You know, when you take a song and you, you research it, develop it and, and, and write it, you learn. And uh, hopefully you'll grow from your own song as well. And for yeah. those who listen to it, will also do the same. Uh, it's great. Steve yeah. Bell says says often our songs know things we don't, and that's the the best yeah. ones. That's true. You, you you really do learn from your own songs. Besides that active, you were just describing the incubation process there really well. Besides mm-hmm. that active incubation, there's also um, yeah, there is that place where the Holy Spirit meets us and helps us say things we didn't even know we knew, which is mm-hmm. such a gift when that happens. So can we maybe tell us some of the things that maybe God's spoken to your heart about over the, uh, the years when it comes to songwriting? Um, maybe transition from back whenever you first st- started doing song to now. And, and what kind of ways has God been kind of speaking to you as far as right songwriting is concerned? I, I, I can dive in a little bit and just say, so at, near the beginning of COVID, um, the Covenant Awards had to go virtual. And um, they were giving me this honor of putting my song Seize the Day in their song Hall of Fame, which was really neat. It was it came out 25 years ago, and that was a neat honor. So I had to give a little speech, and it was just on Zoom like this because we couldn't meet in person at that point. And, of course, we thought that, you know, it was going to be a couple weeks, uh, you know, off the road for everyone, and then the world was going to open back up. And um, But in my speech, I just felt really called to... Um, the, the scriptures that talk about being in exile and what do you do when you're in exile, like COVID is a kind of exile. And that when you're in exile, um, you plant gardens and you seek the welfare of the city. Is that Isaiah? You, you plant gardens and you seek the welfare of the city. And so I was saying to all these fellow musicians, many of whom don't have another job, like I have another job, who will rely on touring for their livelihood. And I was saying, you know, this is a time to plant your garden. And that's gonna look like hopefully writing songs if you're a songwriter but also cultivating the earth to be receptive. You know, Brian Dirksen has this, he says that um, songs are like little seeds that God hands you. And then it's your job to be the kind of dirt in which that seed can grow and to water it. And, you know, I, and I like that picture of that kind of mutuality, you know, very rarely does God give you a song just whole and you don't have to roll up your sleeves, right? But he gives you these little seeds. And, um, so I gave this very, you know, inspiring talk about, you know, this is all of you have been on the road relentlessly. This is your time to go home, cultivate the soil, write songs. And it was, you know, I felt like it was, you know, it was a good speech. And then I hung up and I was like, I am such a hypocrite. I haven't written a song in like, other than my Christmas songs in like three years, right? And um, so it was, a, it was a word to me about, um, uh, about the work it takes, um, you know, early on, I was ambushed by songs all the time. I don't know how it is for you guys, but, you know, in college, man, I could barely go to class because the songs were coming at me so fast. I was always sneaking off to the piano rooms. And when I had those early grinding jobs, all I could do was write songs in my head. And then, I don't know, as I've gotten older and there's more outlets for my creativity and more demands on my time, I can go long, long periods of time without writing songs. And so there is a... For me, this has been a season of uh, learning what faithfulness looks like in this area. And it goes back again to listening to great songs. I, I'd gotten in this habit of only listening to podcasts, which are super helpful. But I wasn't kind of nourishing that part of me that blossoms out into music. And so listening to music and reading great literature and having conversations about ultimate things. And also rolling up your sleeves and banging your head against the wall and and, you know... I, I, I've got a friend who says, I, 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 I hate songwriting. I just like having written a song. That's the only part of it I like. I like having written a song, but I hate the process. So, um, yeah, just showing up, rolling up your sleeves. And, and, and then what happened was, and I just want to say this as an encouragement to anyone who's in a similar place, after years of not writing, 
one song came, then another song came, and then all of a sudden it was like I, I got ambushed again. And I actually had a three or four month period where I couldn't sleep, you know, 4 a.m. writing songs. And it was such a gift, but it was that that faithfulness and that receptivity and and some disciplines to being open and ready and willing for those seats to come. Those of you who are just joining us, um, GMI Hub Online, we have Carolyn Ahrens and we have Kalita Haralin. We're talking about songwriting. And uh, if you're enjoying this experience, please share it with somebody. Let them know um, that this video is there to see. And if you go to the GMI Hub Online on YouTube, we have a library of different videos we'd like for you guys to check out and enjoy as well. <laughs> uh, wow, I don't know what to say after that nice response, Carolyn, because I haven't written anything. And what you have to do is you have to give a public speech somewhere about writing songs, and it will shame you yeah. into uh, writing songs. Yeah, no, go ahead. Exactly. No, Maybe think... this will be your inspiration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have exactly. I've sort of copped out over the last few years and I only write when I'm super inspired, when I'm so inspired that it's like I have no choice but to sit down and start pouring out what I'm experiencing. When I was younger, there was an artist gave everybody a 21 day challenge. You have to write one song every day for 21 days. Oh, I know. I thought that's insane. Wow. That, that's that a deadline. <laughs> Yeah. I, I see, I see artists, fine artists doing that, you know, 30 paintings in a day and they do it. I don't know if I could write 30 songs in it. Well, here's the, here's the thing about it. It's an, he says there never has anybody ever come to them saying I wrote 21 songs and they're all good. They usually use one from, the, from day four. Hey, that works with a song I worked on day six and, and they end up making stuff out of that time period but like it's, it's that that illumination time you have to some people have to force it uh yeah. to make it happen right so exactly just to do it you know and yeah. I, we've heard uh, cheryl and i have talked to many artists over the, the last few months and that's a re repeating um mentor uh, uh sorry mantra is that people say just write just do it uh yeah. just, you know that like that song it doesn't matter if it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. Just sing, sing a song. <laughs> there and you go. The idea behind yeah. it is just do it, you know. I, I always think of, you know, isometrics. When I was a, a kid in gym, um, we used to do isometrics, which is just literally like pushing against an immovable object and, <laughs> and trying to develop muscle that way. Uh, we're talking about writing when you're not inspired, Kalita. You, uh, and then you you can just to further shame you into into more songwriting. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, I used to tell my songwriting students when you're writing uninspired, that's like isometrics. You're you're pushing against something that won't move in order to develop the muscle so that when inspiration comes, you have the muscle to deliver on it. Mm -hmm. Now, Kalita has been writing for so many years that that muscle is there. But I would say, especially for people who are developing writers, building that muscle, writing when you're not inspired is um is hugely important yeah. yeah no i i would i would attest to that yeah that that is great practice you know write 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 and then write some more <laughs> i mean if you want to be a writer that's what you have to do is write and if yeah. you don't like it that's fine you know you can throw it in the garbage or whatever but just it's it is a muscle it it is a craft it's something you hone you have to work at it there's no question mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe maybe the next question I want to ask there's 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 a way you can write a song that's current that maybe that's something that's personal. But what about songs that are timeless? Like, how would you advise someone if they wanted to write a timeless song? What would that mean? Or how would that? Would you how would you answer that? Wow. Well, I I would say first of all maybe you can you know find the timeless songs and analyze them and mm -hmm. see what is it about the song that is you know, lasted all these years that is universal. Uh, that might be, you know, because I have a couple of songs and, you know, I think they're timeless, but it, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how I came up and thought, I, I mean, I, you don't think, oh, I'm gonna write a timeless song. Yeah. No, you, you just yeah. happen to write something that really connects with people and, and, it, and it remains so, just like Carolyn's song all those years ago, she wrote it and it still, prevalent today and probably even more so who knows right yeah 
Great idea. I actually want to do that sometime. Analyze some timeless songs just as a fun thought experiment, yeah. learning experiment. Um, but then, yeah, I would take what I learned from that and then hope to just metabolize it and then not think about it. Just have it there somewhere. I don't think I, I don't, I doubt anyone has ever self-consciously written a timeless song, like said, okay, now I'm going, you know, it's like the, the novelist who's trying to write war and peace and ends up weeping in the corner, similar, similar thing. Um, but I, I, I did learn early on, generally speaking, the more personal something is, the more universal it is, mm -hmm. the more true it is, the more it comes from your guts, like some of the songs Kalita has been talking about, the more it will resonate um, with other people. And again, when I signed my first publishing deal, I went from writing these, you know, like, you know, in my bedroom, you know, prayer, narrative, confession, journal songs, to I thought, okay, now I'm a staff writer, I'm writing for other people, I better get the Carolyn out of this and just write nice general themes. And within about two weeks, you know, my publisher called me from Nashville and said, why have you suddenly started writing terrible, terrible songs? Oh. Stop it, mm -hmm. right? The, what's this generic, there's nothing, you know, what Kalita was saying earlier about find your voice, you know, find your voice and shout. Like, we hired, we wanted you for your voice. Even if someone else is going to sing the song, we thought that there was a particular contribution you could make to the world that sounds like you. And, um, and so that's, so I learned over time, yeah, the more personal something is, generally speaking, the more universal it is. There, there is a, you can go too far um, where you put in a detail that is so specific, unless you're doing a your story, your song uh, kind of song, but for any other kind of song, you put in a detail that's so specific that it shuts people out of the song. And that's what you have to discover at the verification phase. So I would say in the illumination phase, just make it as personal as it can possibly be. And then at the verification phase, you sing it for someone you trust. And if they go, what was that about a washing machine bolt in verse two? Like, you know, then, 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 you know, okay, that is too, that is too obscure. But it, most of the time, um, like I have a song called, a great cloud of witnesses which is based on hebrews 12 and and um just i love the idea that the the people in my family that have gone on to glory that they're sitting there shoulder to shoulder with moses and and abraham and isaac and they're all cheering us on right and so when i was writing the song i actually put in my granddad wilfred and my nana bernice and then I, th when I was writing it, I thought, oh, my, I wonder if that's going to shut people out who don't have a granddad Wilford or a Nana Bernice. Um, but my inspiration was Lyle Lovett because he always puts very specific relatives into his songs. So I, so I thought I'll leave it in. And then in the verification phase, I sang it for some people and they went, no, 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 I, no, wait, I've got a Nana and I can put her, her name and keep, keep those people in. It actually helps me connect more that these are real people and it helps me think of my own grandmother or, or grandfather. So there's an experimentation with that. But I would say when it comes to timeless songs, the more it comes from your guts, the more it's true to your own experience, uh, the greater the chance. But then there's also just got to be, uh, you know, an anointing, uh, maybe a bit of luck and timing with the zeitgeist and, you know, just the, the whole the whole thing. You, you can't control that part of it. You can only just show up and try to write true. What can I say? Like I go in some ways, you're right. I mean, probably the key to a timeless song is how relevant, how, how people can relate to it. Because at any given point in time, um, maybe they don't feel the exact same thing you're feeling at the time that you write the song, but you know, years down the road, they come across a similar situation and then they hear your song and it just, it clicks. It's like, it's right there. And I found that with both the, like, as I was listening to both your songs, uh, your, your musics, mu musics, music, <laughs> you know, uh, your music collections, I was finding that it was like, your songs are kind of timeless, but I think the timelessness is because of the, the ability to relate um, with them, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you probably get that a lot, both of you, you probably get that, oh, that song was so timeless. And, you know, I still remember, Carolyn, when when um, I was actually working at a television station and I got introduced to your song from a coworker who goes, you got to hear this song, you know, and you know what the song was? Seize the day. That was what it was, you know, <laughs> you know, and he That's just cool. like, he's 
he played that over and over. It's like, you got to hear this song. This is the song. I said, okay. You know, All right. and at that time I was still learning about Christian music. So, you know, <laughs> so, but yeah, that that's what related to him. And then, you know, and Cleet, I listened to your songs and I, and uh, there's a depth, there was a depth inside of your songs that I was not expecting. I mean, it was, I, it's almost like I was listening with them, listening to them and I could actually feel, feel what you were feeling as you were writing them, even though you were written them whenever you wrote them. So it was kind of, um, and then I read your, that, that you, you write from your own experiences. So um, you have quite the talent to kind of dig deep, you know, and, and to get that music out there. And, and many people feel what you feel or have felt what you felt and still feel what you feel because they're still listening to your songs and going, yeah, you know, and especially now during COVID, I don't know. I've, I've seen that there's a number of people that, you know, COVID's kind of a hard thing to deal with right now. It's, you know, we're all locked in or, you know, we're restricted of what we can and cannot do. We can't see the people we want to see. And this is the time that, songs like yours and songs like anyone else who's who's listening to this right now can become the inspiration for people to kind of get through this time of covid so thank you ladies for doing that but i'm going to ask one question that normally dale asks but can i ask it this time dale can i can i how can i absolutely go for it. <laughs> um do you have like as as we're closing off do you have up. three bits of advice I know you've shared a lot already but if you had to sum up maybe three things to encourage a songwriter when it comes to writing songs and keeping the inspiration or or whatever's on your heart to share at this point in time what would you say to them just three one two three things <laughs> do you have yours Kalina well, I have a couple. Do you have yours? Uh, if you, you okay. order first, then I'll know what okay. I want to eat by the time you're done. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say that a song is never finished. Hmm. And by that, I mean, you know, you can take it right into the recording studio. You think it's done and then you'll be singing the final vocal and something might just come out of your mouth that something in the phrase that you just... It just came. And I, I love when that happens because we can't always just put it in a box. So be open, be open to change. And, and this is kind of the second one. And just keep writing, writing and writing and editing that song till it's just smooth. It's like butter. Those lyrics just flow and, and they just come so naturally and they, and they sound, they, they, they sound like they are supposed to be paired with the music. There's just a musicality in that. And that takes, that takes time. And, um, and the other thing would be is to, uh, from my own experience, and, and thank you, um, Cheryl, for what you just mentioned about my songs. And it's worked for me. Famous songwriter Guy Clark, he's no longer with us, but he told me years ago, write about what you know. Hmm. And that has been such a, a good piece of advice for me because that's what I've done. And I've not worried about what other people are going to think. Write about what you know and others will understand and relate. All right. Yeah. Um, Your turn. I, uh, I would say a one, one sort of practical thing for those of you who write lyrics is uh, they've done they've done research. People enter into your song with you through their imagination, and the imagination engages the best with concrete things rather than abstractions. So abstractions are ideas, you know, faith, hope, love, salvation, sanctification, justice, mercy. These things are all very important abstractions, but concrete things are a hand with a nail in it or a hug or butterflies in your stomach when you're falling in love. They're like physical, tangible things. And so I want to give you a challenge to go through your lyrics and every place where there's an abstraction, see if you can replace it with a concrete that um, can stand in for that abstraction. So I, I remember hearing Chris Rice's song that says, sometimes love has to drive a nail into its own hand. Mm. And when I heard that concrete, the abstraction of what Christ did for me that I'd known since I was a little kid, you know, roared back into life again. So 
Anytime you have an abstraction, see if you can replace it with a concrete. That's number one. Number two is um, never write, or if you're a performer, perform to impress. Mm -hmm. Write or perform to serve, to bless. So it's a corny little phrase, but don't impress them, bless them. Ask, ask what would most serve somebody in their journey rather than make them think that you're really cool and do that. And um, the third thing would be to live creatively. If, if, uh, and that, that meaning live, live like Kalita was saying, open to the Holy Spirit speaking into and out of the thick of your days and do things really intentionally that get your juices flowing. So take yourself on artist dates, um, do things. If you notice that, man, anytime I watch, you know, films by this director, I want to write a song afterwards, then once a week or once a month, you should be watching a film by that director. If you notice every time I go out and I just people watch, I find myself writing, then do that. Like weave that into your life, live creatively. Don't expect creativity to be just some, like a gear that you shift into just at designated times, but live creatively and openly, which again is kind of like living like a disciple, believing that God it has something to say to you in the, in the nitty gritty of your life. Very true. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's been a great word. Thank you. Um, I, I, now, some have said that um, there are people that mentor others. I think you're great examples of women mentors for songwriters, but I think above that, you're good mentors for songwriters in general because uh, decades of music and blessing and helping other people and connecting with people, it just proves to me that uh, if, if someone out there wants to listen to some music to help develop their writing skills, these ladies are the ones you should be looking at and checking out their material, going online and really listening and reading the words and seeing how they work in context with the theme of the song. You will learn something, believe me. And I want to thank you both for joining us on the show today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, it's just been an awesome time. Thank you for what you guys are doing to connect uh, yeah. musicians and artists, bring bring the community together. It's such important work now more than ever. I mean, there's not really like a whole system of gatekeepers anymore. We all just have to kind of figure this out together. And it's really awesome what you guys are doing. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you. I echo what, what Dale says to thank you both ladies. I mean, I, I think I've learned so much about inspiration. I'm inspired now <laughs> to write myself. So <laughs> maybe I'll send you a few little lines and go, does this work? <laughs> awesome. But I also want to thank you audience for, for joining us. I, I, Pray and hope that you have gleaned, not just learned, but gleaned the nuggets that have been shared today with, with Carolyn and Kalita. I mean, they shared uh, from their experience, from their knowledge, they they shared deep stuff. Like right? There's golden nuggets here. So I hope you all too, uh, gleaned from this. I was taking notes. So, <laughs> um, and I... I also pray like this is going to be recorded. We're going to keep this on YouTube. So, you know, go ahead and share this link, share the experience. There are probably other songwriters that would, would love to learn from this and to, and, and to apply what they're learning here to their writing experience. Don't do a disservice to them, service them by sharing this. I also want to uh, remind you that as was sort of alluded to uh, in earlier, we do have a Christmas album that is coming out, would you believe it, October 30th, which is this Friday. And it's going to feature a number of, uh, number of original music written by your very own artists from here, from Ontario and from Canada. So uh, look out for it. It's going to be available October 30th. It's going to be on Bandcamp, but we are pitching it to radio stations. So listen out for it. Um, I'm praying, hint, hint, nudge, nudge radio stations that you will play some of the music for, for everyone to hear because you know what, Canadian artists, there's many talents that are here and a lot of it is hidden. And I think it's time for you to come out uh, time for your talents to come out and to serve and to and to bless not to impress but to bless <laughs> thank you so much for being with us we will be back next time next monday 7 p.m uh eastern time 4 p.m pacific time um with another topic related to ministry so we look forward to seeing you then 